with the Soil Carbon Coalition. And we certainly welcome his in Iowa and his knowledge that he brings to us. One thing that you might want to realize this morning is it's being videotaped. And so that you'll be able to watch this at a later time than I'm told. So, hey, welcome to Iowa. Nice to be here. It's, uh, every time I get back, to come back to Iowa, I love it a little bit more. You have really deep soil here. <laughs> the point of the talk is talking about soil insecurity and maybe the fact that we ha don't remember it as well or it's not a, always a topic of popular discussion that our basic security comes from soil health. It's unavoidable. It was really a big popular topic topic in the 30s, like in the 1938 USDA yearbook of agriculture on soils and men. That's a really profound document to me. And then grass was another document, uh, yearbook of agriculture that had similar themes. Urban realization, people who live in the city and their recognition of the importance of soil is not enough, I don't think. I really enjoyed the talk, the keynote last night and the emphasis on sustainable agricultural production and the health of soil and the health of water and the health of air. And we're not gonna serve it if it, if it does anything to degrade those things. And uh, I think it's real opportunity for people like us to be making more money, to be dealing with people who are willing to pay a premium for food that's uh, produced in a way that supports the improvement of soil. But I think it actually may be good for us to go even further in the next decade or two because we're really running out of the services that come from soil. So for this city, I don't think this picture is real. I think this is a Photoshop. I wouldn't <laughs> put it here and be funny, but it's clearly too late for them to be thinking about this stuff anymore. <laughs> or maybe when they rebuild, they'll want to. So I graze dairy cattle, or <laughs> I used to graze dairy cattle, now I graze beef cattle in St. Albans, Vermont. I founded a company called Carbon Farmers of America some years ago, which was sort of a carbon offset thing with soil carbon credits before that stuff picked up. And it was an intellectual exercise, and I won't say it went all that far or ever cash flowed, but it certainly got us talking to a lot of people about potential for one sort of payment for environmental services based on soil improvement, and that was about regulating the atmosphere, which uh, soil, organic matter levels certainly are completely connected to the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. And I still believe that we can influence and probably we're the key, us farmers and grazers, to reversing global warming, so to speak, pulling a bunch of CO2 out of the air and putting it in soil and not only regulating atmospheric carbon levels or influencing them, but also atmospheric water, nitrogen, and other elements. Um, these days I do, I've been doing a lot of work with an organization I've been building called New Soil Quantum and that's about measuring the benefits that come from changed soil properties to the rest of society and what that means in economic terms and I'll get more into that and also working with the Soil Carbon Coalition which is traveling around the U.S. right now taking baseline soil carbon measurements on farms and ranches. So this will all come together, I hope, as we march through the presentation. So here's a GIS screenshot of the farm at home. And I think a lot of this philosophy, and I hope not too much fluff that I'm going to be sharing in the next few minutes, comes from being a farmer on the land with livestock and thinking about the problems, the practical problems I face every day, the little solutions that I come up with or talk with neighbors or collaborators somewhere around the country or the world about with and implement it and it works or doesn't work. But then I think about, okay, I just changed soil properties in the last year or two on my farm and that's meant this to me. But if I scale this up, if a thousand people like me did this on another, on, on a thousand hundred acre farms in this watershed, what would that mean for Lake Champlain's water quality where I live? And it's very polluted and so forth. And I think that it does add up. I've been using more and more technologies and I got over my, my Luddism, is that a word? Um, Lud Ludditism. I, I've gotten over my Ludditism and I've really come to believe, it's mostly because of my love for the internet. And um, also my recent involvement with high-tech soil monitoring. 
it's amazing what we can do now. I think that we're in for some breakthroughs in how fast we can learn with each other, sharing information, how fast, how well we can understand what's happening in soils, especially in response to our management. And it goes on and on. I don't mind technology anymore. This is a, an amazing example, as usual, on offer from Google. Um, this is the Google Earth engine. This is decades worth of publicly av available satellite imagery. And in this case, we can look at a, any chosen piece of land we want on Earth over long time spans and understand the greenness through uh, the enhanced vegetative index and some other satellite imagery. I like to select my farm and go through a year and look at, wow, this field was doing real, seemingly better than this field. And we can actually analyze it more than just visually, but it's just an example. I'm not going to go into the details too far. Some of the things we do on the farm are experimenting with grazing at different densities and what it can do for our production and what it seems to do for soil. I'm on so, uh, clay eight feet deep, and I've really become a fan of a subsoil or plow as a way to physically aerate the soil, but not just as a one-off or I'm going to, in some ways, if I was just subsoiling every now and then, I might as well just be pour, pouring the diesel directly on the ground. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the way that we're doing it is key line soil formation. It's a sequence of grazing, moisture, plant regrowth, and subsoiling events that was invented about 60 years ago in Australia. And this fellow named P.A. Yeomans figured out that by creating a series of climaxes in the soil, optimum air, physical looseness, plant growth conditions, and soil microbiology conditions, that we could take soil states from uh, sort of retarded or <laughs> comp uh, compacted and not doing so well into we could build new topsoil, convert subsoil to topsoil pretty quickly. So doing that, doing the grazing and doing this sort of stuff, again, it leads me to the thought of multiplied many times the successes that we're seeing with this on a watershed scale would really add up to a different water quality outcome for the state of Vermont in, in the case where I am. Leaving lots of litter. This is an example. This soil profile went from uh, very much more shallow than this to about 18 inches. We saw about eight inches of conversion of subsoil to topsoil in a single year. That's amazing. And I'm not exactly sure about all the details of how it's happening. And a lot of people, it's almost uh, preposterous. <laughs> and that's the response of a lot of people. But something happened here. And so this is part of why I'm more and more inclined to use technologies that can help me to understand this and to share my experiences with other people who are doing this as well. Because we have 60 years worth of practitioners around the world doing stuff like key line, for example, and seeing similar results. So I'll go into my opening assumptions. Um, that increasing soil carbon, I'm called often a one element guy. <laughs> Some people, oh, he's just about carbon. And it's kind of true. I mean, it, it's a fair critique. I, I love carbon as an element. It's, it amazes me um, how much of our lives, our thoughts, everything we do is based around carbon bonds, <laughs> carbon, element, carbon atoms sticking together. Increasing soil carbon is key to environmental security, rural and urban economic development. Um, the energy in carbon bonds is what fuels our thoughts, our actions, our economies. It's how we eat. The cities that right now spend huge amounts of money on insurance, flood regulation, fixing the, of uh, erosion damaged infrastructure, flooding, wildfire, and on and on, they need what comes from soil because regulation of all those things come from soil. And those services that come from topsoil are decreasing annually as we lose topsoil. The rate of topsoil loss compared to the rate of topsoil formation in the US, I think, is 10 times to the negative. And in China and uh, Africa, I think the rate is 30 to 40 times more soil loss and soil formation. That, that's a dire situation. Obviously, can't go on. But there's one other notion. I know this is the. Uh, 
controversial one maybe, but topsoil can be built pretty quickly if about 100 years worth of regenerative agricultural development around the world is correct. People like the English lay farmers, people like Louis Bromfield in, in Malabar Farm in Ohio, the Yeoman family in Australia, and more and more. And there's lots of individual farms who have achieved some pretty amazing things, but the information tends to be lost. In my experience, I've seen some amazing things, but uh, it's not well enough documented or measured through monitoring. So cities need it and land managers can produce it, soil and the services that come from soil, and we should let the markets begin, right? It takes work to do this, we should be paid for it. We're not just growing food, we're growing clean air, clean water, uh, recharged groundwater, etc. But it's not that simple, there's more to it. There are some pilots that are working though. Back to 1938 in the USDA yearbook of agriculture, Char Charles Kellogg asking, do civilizations fall because the soils fail to produce? Or does the soil fail only when the people living on it no, lo no longer know how to manage their civilization? I love that quote. It's on my email, so it reminds me every day. There's a lot of wisdom in there, and it's basically a call of saying everything we do depends on the soil, Let's get it together. We're not doing a good job of running our society. I mean, economic collapses and wars and poverty and all kinds of things and hungry kids, these are all signs of failing society. But uh, the really big one, the one that doesn't go away no matter what else we do is if we're losing soil faster than it's being built, it's a short-term project. So if we could accelerate topsoil formation on ag, grazing, and desert land, we could address resource problems at a meaningful local scale, something that would be, have enough effect locally to motivate people, but, and it, keep, it can keep adding up to the global scale. If we in, improve certain soil properties, we increase ag production. If soil is covered, deep, crumb structure, high carbon, and so forth. As we improve these same soil properties, we get increased water storage in, and purification in soils and aquifers. Um, a lot of cities are running out of groundwater, and a lot of ag aquifers, like the Ogallala, are, they're dropping, and that's a big deal. Improved soil properties leads to mitigation of flooding, drought, wildfire, erosion, landslides, dust storms, eutrophication, like the algaeing up of our waterways, and the hypoxia, how the oxygen disappears as, as that pollution leads to al algal blooms, and ocean dead zones. It's amazing, these are all massive problems. These things cost a lot of money and they can all be traced back to the state of soil properties. And climate change mitigation and adaptation. Mitigation and adaptation, those are two words that are both pretty important to me. Mitigation means, I think, that we can, we can influence the composition of our atmosphere. Uh, by how we manage land. This is just a, a fact of world, uh, earth history, as I was talking with Tom Franson about last night. Tom Franson loves earth history, by the way, if anyone wants to learn about, a lot about earth history. Um, but the atmosphere and the biosphere are coupled systems. Actually, the atmosphere, the biosphere, the hydrosphere, the lithosphere, the earth is a big coupled system. and. Gaia uh, theory says that it's a homeostatic self-regulating organism, that without life on Earth, we'd have a balanced atmosphere, one that wouldn't be this impossible uh, proportion of gases like 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and a fraction of a percent carbon dioxide. So how we manage land is completely related to how our atmosphere uh, what our atmosphere is composed of. We can impact our atmosphere. Climate change is very tied to human activity, and it doesn't have to be just thought of negatively. It can be thought of very positive, positively, as in land managers, grazers, farmers, foresters, are a big part of the answer to regulating the atmosphere for the rest of human time. Uh, it may, it may be the case that we need to build up a bunch of soil carbon in the next few decades, kind of address this little blip, a blip on the radar, this problem we're having with a buildup of green, greenhouse gases. And then maybe someday down the road, uh, 
we may need to burn a whole bunch of coal and heat things up very quickly, you know, to an avert, avert a coming ice age. We'll see. Um, there are current payment for environmental services that are establishing. There are models establishing that I think are important precedents that we can think about. I'd like us to start thinking about organizing ourselves as mini OPECs all over the place. We can do that. But this time, as OPECs, we won't be selling carbon bonds that can be broken, like selling oil that can be burned and power civilization. We'll be selling a service of creating carbon bonds in soils, building up soil organic matter. Water is the new oil, and soil carbon is the key to water. I don't mean to be pat or smug or to degrade the, the, the importance of water by saying it's the new oil, but this is a statement you hear everywhere. People are saying the wars in the coming decades are going to be fought over water. Water quality and water quantity are so critical. We're looking at an enormous shortages of availability in the next even 20 years uh, worldwide. So water is really important, and if we really want to address water, we're going to uh, address the soil surface and the water holding capacity and the rooting depth in soils. That is the key. Carbon markets have been pretty problematic so far. <laughs> I lose <clears throat> faith every day in how effective those may be in the long run uh, because there's so much, they start to look like hedge funds and all this derivatives trading and so forth. And I just don't know if I have all that much trust in them anymore. But they are established and uh, there are things happening, although they're falling apart as fast as they're being built in some instances. Wetland and habitat mitigation banking is an enormous industry in the U.S. Are people familiar with uh, mitigation banking? If you're going to damage a wetland in a lot of places in the U.S., you're pretty much required by, by environmental regulations to repair a wetland, build a wetland, on-site or off-site, the regulations and the options vary. But this is a multi-billion dollar industry in the U.S. on an annual basis. People are making a lot of nickels on this. And it has to do with, it's, it's actually, it's, it's intended to be uh, net gain stuff. In other words, if you damage a, an acre of wetland, you're expected to build or repair or restore a couple acres of wetland within watershed in most cases. Uh, payment for watershed services, I'll talk about a few concrete examples. But cities are starting to pay land managers if those land managers do things which benefit the functioning of the whole watershed. Anyone know about the instance of Wichita, Kansas, where farmers are being paid to uh, basically keep cropping off of the waterways that lead to the main drinking water reservoir for the city? It's one instance, but uh, payment for watershed services are picking up around the world and in the U.S. Some new payment for environmental service market opportunities through soil formation that I think we could be thinking about are natural hazards mitigation, flooding, drought, wildfire, erosion damage to infrastructure. All these things are basically symptoms of degraded soil properties. And we could save cities billions of dollars if we were fixing these things upstream. Louis Bromfield is a an author, a writer, and a farmer who did a lot of work in the 40s and 50s in Ohio. And he has a great chapter. He has one chapter called On Building Topsoil 10,000 Times Faster Than Nature. I like that chapter. And then he has another chapter on creating a paradise. And he talks about work that the US government did with communities of building uh, ponds and ponds and improving land management in whole watersheds in the 30s and 40s, where they got rid of flooding and so forth by improving the circumstances at the tops of the watersheds. In other words, flooding regulation begins in the fields and the forests where the raindrops originally fell. So we can uh, offer a service of natural hazards mitigations to cities and save them a fortune and create a lot of economic op opportunity and really security. Uh, municipal water provision through increased infiltration of precip resulting in groundwater recharge and purification. Small changes to soil properties like increasing the amount of litter on uh, multiplied across acres on large watersheds can mean that a greater percentage of water 
goes down and recharges aquifers. This is a big deal. This is an answer that really isn't being pursued widely enough, but it's, it's sort of an elephant in the room to me. If, if your aquifers are drying out, some people are pumping water from rivers and so forth directly into artificial recharge of aquifers, but another way to do it would be, wow, a 10% increase in litter cover over the whole of a watershed would add up to more and more aquifer recharge. This can be, we can conceive of this now with modern modeling technologies, uh, soil monitoring and so forth, and even remote sensing technologies, we could actually plan and implement schemes like this. And I say schemes in a positive sense. Restoration and flow maintenance of surface waters. There are limited examples, but land managers who are changing soil properties like litter on the surface are making streams flow and springs flow where they haven't before. Has anyone in this room seen or heard of instances like this or achieved it themselves? Hey, one, excellent. Uh, where, was, where was that instance of improved stream flow and so forth? That's great. I, it's the Savory Institute, the one rather, the Africa Center for Holistic Management, they've moved a river a few miles upstream in a pretty short uh, time frame. Even It's flowing, even in the dry season, more than a mile, let me say that, upstream. That's really exciting to me. I've heard some stories from Greg Judy where he has streams that haven't flowed for a long time that are now perennial streams. There are a lot more instances, but this is a big deal and these little instances, we need to capture this and build on it and think about what it could mean for whole watersheds if it were multiplied. Um, water efficiency enabled by reduced irrigation is a really big deal. It's between 70 and 80% of global fresh water use is for irrigation. It's most of the fresh water we use. And a lot of it isn't necessarily very efficient. There's some research done at the University of Florida and they were looking at changes to soil properties under sod vegetable production rotations. And what they found is because of the increased rooting depth and sort of sponge capacity of soils that had been under a sod phase, that they could reduce the irrigation by as much as, to, to, by as much as 10 times. One tenth of the amount of irrigation water could grow the same amount of vegetables as they used to use. You gotta realize there's been a lot of transfer of water rights through sale, through leasing, it really depends, but in the last couple decades from agriculture to cities. In some cases it's just being taken away, in other cases it's being offered. But there's one other piece to this is that when you have irrigation and grass and grazing animals, we can have a really big impact on soil properties. In other words, we can rapidly change soil properties for the better. And we might want to be thinking about, let w this is a good time to think about how can we use irrigation to improve soil properties, <coughs> reduce our reliance on that irrigation, and then have more water available for all of society, more or less. I know it sounds pretty ambitious, but it probably is good for us to be on the, to be thinking about this ahead of time, and not just to be the recipients of people saying, Listen, our city's out of water, you're using it less efficiently and creating less economic value than we'll be if we use it. We need to lease it or take it or whatever from you. <laughs> this will be happening more and more and we should probably be aware and on the front foot about this. I don't wanna be too repetitive, but what I wanna say is that if we come up with solutions to improving soil properties on our farms and ranches and we scale them, we can solve watershed wide problems and that has real implications for the security of cities and people who don't live on farms and it can and it has economic value i think the big soil properties so i'm not just saying oh we just all of a sudden turn subsoil into topsoil 10 feet deep that wasn't there last year or something there, it's on a continuum and the properties that we can change through agricultural management i think we've all seen instances of maybe one or more of these uh, we can increase soil cover. That has a big impact on watershed dynamics. Uh, we can increase 
plant diversity, soil organism diversity, and again, this has a big impact on greenness through the year, on total agricultural production, and on disease control, in both in crops, in livestock, and even humans through, <laughs> through the nutrition we get from the food. Soil carbon, to me, is the central metric. If soil carbon is decreasing, that's, a, that's the big negative that we need to be uh, really worried about. If it's increasing, that's a great sign that we're doing something right and that we're providing more environmental service to the rest of society. Soil crumb structure aggregation, somehow there's more snots and glues gluing things up in a positive way in the soil, and that's a good thing. And the depth of the topsoil is very much related to, uh, and correlated to agricultural production levels, to uh, the water holding capacity of that soil, uh, to the total ag production. When we scale up, if we achieve these successes on our farm and we scale it up, there we have watersheds that are working and cities that are more secure. You have a massive rainstorm. You're going to get less flooding. That city will be more secure. You have a dry season. Things really dry up. Wells start dropping. We can, we can impact that. If we soaked in more water upstream during the rainy period, those wells will stay longer, uh, stay fuller longer. They'll be less uh, subject to the dangers of wildfire in the surrounding hinterlands of the city and so forth. There'll be, if uh, oil prices spike all of a sudden, that city will be less reliant on the imported fossil fuels to run the wells and so to pump more water that they may not have. It's funny to me, but all these things do come from topsoil. I think that looking at it from a sophisticated urban manager's perspective, that paying land managers to increase soil carbon and enhance soil properties in general is smart urban planning. And in a lot of cases, I think a lot of municipalities are running out of options. They're taxed, you know, there's not enough revenue to cover everything. Uh, a lot of the putting out of fires and costs related to maintaining the infrastructure of their city, they're prohibitively expensive. We're in, I guess we're in a recovery or a recession or something. And uh, there's not enough money oftentimes to do what we need to do. If I were to play the part of an urban manager who understood my city's reliance on the watershed around us, I would say that I need functional hydrology. I need the groundwater recharge. I know, need flowing streams and rivers year round. I want sustained reservoir recharge. I need water quality. I don't want uh, nitrates in my water and blue baby syndrome and all kinds of horrible things like this. I want minimized flooding, wildfire, dust storms, eutrophication. I want lots of biodiversity around me uh, because of the pollination, drought resistance, disease resistance that that brings. I want opportunities for the substitution of, if, instead of buying more insurance, I, if I could be paying land managers to improve soils, that would be a great way to do it. There are instances where that's happened, where insurance has decreased because soil properties have been improved. Um, <laughs> fewer dams and pipelines being built, and we're really out of good dam sites in many cases. And so you can build pipelines for interbasin water transfer, but if the water source in the other basin is running low at the same time, then it becomes sort of a fruitless exercise. Disaster cleanup, digging out roadside ditches, dam silting, uh, decreased reservoir capacity. A guy named Jules Pretty did a study, and in that study he pulled up some data and he found that in the United States in 1985, we were spending $5 billion a year, I think, on digging out roadside ditches for, from agricultural soil erosion. Not only were we losing the soil from our fields, we were spending five billion getting it out of the ditches, paying excavators and spending money on diesel fuel. Five billion is a very big number. <laughs> Security and wealth for our city is also going to include strong agriculture and farming and ranching economics in the hinterland, in the land adjoining our city. So a couple cases in point, so this isn't just all conjecture and speculation. Um, New York City is a good case in point. In, the in 1989, the EPA passed new water uh, quality regulations, and they said, New York City, you have an unfiltered 
water system for your millions of inhabitants and your water quality has degraded to the point where you need to build a new water treatment system. And the cost of that is gonna be six to eight billion dollars and 300 million in annual operating. Well, New York City was sort of staggered by this and said, boy, this isn't really feasible. We need to think of doing something else. So what they did is they in, uh, created an agency and they initiated a 10 year planning process. And there was a lot of negotiating and thinking, but they said, what if we improve the upstream watershed health and not build the water treatment plant? Could that do, have the same outcome? Could that improve our water quality? And the upshot is that it did. Uh, they spent $1.5 billion on investment in improved septic systems, a bunch of best management practices for the farms that are up there. Uh, they purchased land uh, that would, instead of going to development, it's being maintained as fields, forests, and so forth. So they spent $1.5 billion and got the same outcome, which is improved water, water quality downstream. This is a great example, and there's problems, sure, like, like anything. Nothing's perfect or just some big dream that rolls out flawlessly. But on the other hand, New York City is not filtering its water. It has clean water, and it's invested in the economics of upstream communities. I like the story of Swan and Bodhi in northern India because it's sort of a pure example. The wells are running dry in the village of Swan. Upstream in Bodhi, there was on the hillsides, the trees were being cut for fuel, and you had pretty bad grazing management, as you can imagine. Uh, the people in Swan said to the people in Bodhi, we'll re replant the slopes for you. We will give our labor um, because our hydrology downstream is being negatively impacted by your land management upstream. We can't pay you, but we'll give what we have to help you in a win-win uh, win -win arrangement. We'll help replant, you'll have more fuel and firewood, and we'll have better uh, hydrology downstream. So in Bodhi, they got increased fodder and fuel, and there was also changed agricultural management. And in Swan, their well water started, their well levels started raising within a few years. This is a pretty good example to me. A business to business example in which a bunch of farmers and the corporation involved all made a lot of money is uh, in Vital, France. Have people ever had Perrier water? Fancy bubble water. Uh, the company that was bottling that water was making, it was Nestle actually, was making a lot of money but they were starting to lose money because they were detecting contamination in the groundwater. And it's because the upstream watershed, which used to be pastoral grassland, had gone to corn. So they had all kinds of nitrates and pesticides and herbicides getting into this very lucrative um, mineral water source. So again, there was study and there was thought and there's probably a little bit of vision going into this. Um, Nestle said to the farmers, we will uh, make a deal with you. And in that deal, we'll pay you for five years, 110 bucks an acre per year. If you regrass, compost, and uh, start doing better land management. And there was like 20 to 30 year contracts. The farms also just got a lump payment. Here's 200 grand, buy some tractors, build some buildings, whatever. It's that important to us. Uh, here's, a, here's something to sweeten the deal, in other words. And Nestle also said, we'll also annually provide compost labor to get that compost out onto your fields and free ongoing technical assistance for the life of the contract. It worked. Their water, their water supply cleaned up. The farmers made a, a lot of money, to be honest, probably more money on these payments than they were making on some of their ag production. And those are three examples. I count about 40 broad categories of tools for improving soil properties. It grows every time I go and meet new people, I have to say. I read a lot of books on this, especially in the last 100 years, there's been some really, really good research. The English lay farmers are some, some, a group of people who have really influenced me. Newman Turner, Fred Sykes, William Lehman, Robert Elliott, 
Um, I'm very much influenced by key line landscape design and soil formation. I've really been influenced by holistic management. And I'm starting to meet more and more producers in the US who have a big impact on me. I'm gonna talk about the Burley County boys briefly as an example. Have people heard about what's going on up in Burley County, North Dakota with cocktail cover cropping? Some people have. I'm very excited by it. The results that are, they're achieving up there with just creative, practical farming are very impressive. They're broad scale grain farmers. Um, I think Gabe Brown, for instance, who's a friend and someone I've learned a lot from, I think he's cropping on about 4,000 acres. And in this case, he's taking off a wheat crop, combines it off, and then he goes in and he's chosen a mixture of 10 to 20 variety of seed, uh, varieties of seed, and he's drilled them in as a cocktail of a uh, cocktail cover crop. I'm not, I think that cocktail refers to the diversity of seeds and probably there are some, like last night at the Best Western, there were some cocktails that went into the <laughs> idea generation. While his neighbor's fields are chemically fallowed, he's growing a huge amount of biomass right next door. Boy, you should see this on Google Earth Engine. The greenness index is through the roof. It's striking. So 65 days after seeding, He's got a massive store of biomass, six, seven, eight tons of biomass produced while the neighbor's land is essentially, and I don't mean his immediate neighbor, but I mean sort of a county norm. You have chemically fallow land producing no, you know, there's no photosynthesis going on. There's no work being done by the land. The land is being idled while his land is chugging along on eight cylinders. He's grazing those cocktail cover crops, often leaving 70% of the biomass as litter. The rate of gain on these particular livestock was 3.1 pounds per day in November. That's awesome, huh? <laughs> That's awesome, and pretty cheap. I, I think the cost, they're, they're actually realizing a, a, a net profit um, just based on the, the beef gains. So their cost per acre, I think it's about, a, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm blanking a little bit, but they're spending less than $100 per acre to, to get all this in, to, to get all the seeds planted. And they end up making money in the end. But the real, really big benefits start to come when you look at the whole system. And in the whole system, in 11 years, Gabe has increased his organic matter about 265%. It's not absolute, of course, that's not an absolute number, but going from 1.5% on up toward five. And this is not his monitoring, this is the NRCS. Uh, the NRCS and RCD collaborators who are doing this monitoring. Uh, I think they probably need to do a more formal monitoring program that's more replicable. We all do. They've had a 12-fold increase in water infiltration, half inch an hour to six inches per hour. Think about that, scale that up to a watershed level. If the Mississippi River watershed, if you had a 12-fold increase in precipitation infiltration over that watershed, there might be a reduction in the incidence and severity of flooding, for example. And certainly, <laughs> in, the in the nutrient, the nutrients being carried down that river and ending up in the Gulf of Mexico, which relates to some of the next points. Well, one of the neat instances was 13.6 inches of rain fell in 22 hours a few years back and they had zero erosion on that land. That's a big deal. There was a little bit of litter movement, but no actual erosion. So litter movement's not a big deal compared to those sort of the, the massive gullies we, we know happen on bare ground with rain events like this. 10% is the amount of fertilizer that Gabe uses relative to the county average. But his production is in the neighborhood of 40% greater than the county average. He's, produ he's producing, on average, 117 bushels of corn per acre compared to 70 bushels. Pretty low rainfall up there. I think 14, 15 inches annually is the normal amount. He's also using a quarter or less of the herbicide. These are phenomenal numbers. Actually, Gabe is 
Gabe and people like him are starting to make a lot of money and they're doing it by paying attention to soil health, biodiversity, and they're uh, trying to mimic prairie processes in their cropping. They're doing a really good job and scaled up, this could add up to a completely different scenario for, let's just think big, the Mississippi River watershed and where it flows into the Gulf of Mexico. So some of the tools and capabilities that we may want to be developing, if we want to start thinking about being not only providers of food to society, but providers of water security, for example, and mitigation of natural hazards. I tend to suspect that if we look at this on a watershed scale, it may be the most fruitful way to think about it. Think about your own watershed. What are the big natural resource problems? If you keep thinking back, why does that happen? Why does that happen? Why does that happen? Or is there a possibility that the water quality issues in your watershed are actually related to, to the soil management, to the soil properties? Is there, a, is there a possibility that the flooding, drought, wildfire, expenditures on insurance, all these other things, can, are those connected to soil properties? And could those be changed if land managers took a different approach to soil management? In some cases, us land managers, I think we'd love to do the right thing and improve soil properties and keep the soil covered with more litter and so <coughs> forth, but we feel like there's a sacrifice. If I'm putting more litter onto the soil, that's meat that I'm not selling and I'm already maybe not, you know, I've got slim margins. It would probably be smart for the city to say, well, gee, if there was only a 20% increase in litter on half the land in this watershed, that would really, that would reduce the peak amount of uh, water flow during rain, rain events and reduce the, the damage to our infrastructure and maybe we could uh, work out a deal on reduced insurance. So the things we need for this, we need managers who can deliver and that is amongst us. And I think Practical Farmers of Iowa is probably one of the best organizations I've ever seen for having a networked, active, sharing, researching, real citizen science focused. I love what you're doing, and I think this is a perfect example of the kind of community that's building each other. But we all need to be able to do management that improves soils. We need to be able to monitor and quantify changes to soil properties. And, we pro and it actually means a break with historical soil monitoring norms. How many of us have said, oh, if you want to do a soil test, you know, walk a big W across your field, shake it up, put it in a bag, send it to the lab, and we'll send you back some results and you can make some management decisions based on that. That's great and that points us in a direction. <coughs> but if I do that and I say, hey, my organic matter is 4% in the top six inches or whatever, and four years later I do it again, and it's like, hey, my organic matter is 5.5% uh, now. The thing is, Soil has high spatial variability. It's really different here and there, just even in a meter or <laughs> a, a couple inches. It's not replicable, the old monitoring uh, methods that we were using as farmers. It's time to sort of ramp it up. If we want to be able to think better about soils, we need to use better soil monitoring tools. The neat thing is they're now available to us. I'm going to talk more about one in just a second. Um, Based on advanced soil or high resolution soil monitoring, we can actually now model watershed function. We can plan scenarios. We can say if we increase the litter or the organic matter or the rooting depth, you know, let's change these variables around in soils. If we change some of these things, we could change how water is acting in a whole watershed and we can, there's a lot of advanced models that can really, we can think about whole watersheds. We need to come up with the economic value if we can decrease or increase precipitation infiltration into our soils 50%, what's the economic value to Wichita or Phoenix or Burlington, Vermont? It actually has value. And there's a lot of evolving, uh, developing tools right now that are focused on just this. One of them is called ARIES, Artificial Intelligence for Ecosystem Services. And it's a pretty amazing tool. I've been following it for years now. But coupled to economic valuation tools, they're actually starting to say, you've got a city here, you've got a bunch of farms here, you've got forests here, 
uh, here's the flow, here are the here's a list of the environmental benefits that each of these natural areas around the city provide. Here is the flow of those benefits and who's benefiting in the downstream areas. And here's the economic value using all these different analytical methods. But there is economic value. If you took away those fields, uh, that city would lose, lose services and it would have to use uh, money to substitute for those services as one example. So monitoring tools, watershed modeling tools, economic valuation tools, communication tools, waving your hands about soil and eco ecosystem services and so forth. <sighs> you get tired, some of you have fallen asleep, I get tired, I'm doing my best, but it's hard to put these big ideas into words, and especially with not people who aren't directly involved. There are other ways to communicate this, and again, I'm back to technology. Here's just an example of computer imagery having to do with water sh uh, modeling watershed dynamics. I think this is of Phoenix. Oh, Arizona State University, they've built a whole <laughs> decision support the theater, 3D, uh, 3D theater, kind of like IMAX, but this is our watershed. Want to game it? And you have dozens of people in there, and it's like, let's model scenarios, and if this is what happens, just an example, but people are already working on this. Um, finally, if we can communicate the value of changed soil properties to people in cities, if the people in cities can start to understand it better, if we can run scenarios, it may get to the point of cities saying, we want to do this. We want to work with land managers to improve soil properties to give us long-term security. And at that point, we're going to need to plan, broker, and execute deals. And really, I do believe that there is a different future that's possible and that we can lead. We don't have to be the recipients or passive about this. And that different future is we're not just going to grow your food anymore. We're going to grow your water. And we're going to grow your flood protection. And so think about that. I mean, just, just think. I guess all I'm asking is I'm planting this seed for you. But uh, this is a different future that we could be in the driver's seat on. We need to be able to think in whole watersheds, underground and above ground, and across time. That's a pretty tall order, but, but let's start thinking about ways that we can do that. One of the most, the biggest breakthroughs that I've seen, and this uh, tool has changed my life, to be honest. It has really given me a lot of hope, and it's given me uh, much more interest in technologies that can be enabling tools for us land managers. It's called the Soil Information System, invented by a brilliant guy who's become a friend named Dan Rooney. And um, Dan was sort of based out of Madison, Wisconsin when he did a lot of this development. But what he's done is take a bunch of soil monitoring technologies <coughs> and a bunch of algorithms, and he's created a tool that can give us highly accurate and very precise soil information really to any depth across any size landscape. Being able to see underground is a neat thing. We did a deployment of this tool down in Virginia. And you know, some people fall in love and some people find religion. I got to see underground on that day. And it was a big <laughs> deal for me. And when the data came back, not years later, because boy, have I done with collecting, have I dealt with collecting soil data and you know, a year later I'm starting to get everything back and then it's analysis. And this thing's, in a couple of hours, it gathers 40,000 data points in a field. So anyway, I really like this tool. And actually, for years, I've been working to raise the money to be able to deploy one of these units to run around the country. Because when this, and capture data on the progressive managers who are the exceptions, who are the people who are achieving crazy results on their soils? And let's really quantify it. What are those changes to soil properties? And if we fed that data, into watershed modeling, what would be the implications, for example, uh, groundwater recharge on a watershed scale, and then we could run scenarios. I, this may sound like just hmm, fantasies, but it's not. Some, someday I'm going to come up with a million bucks, and we're going to be running this thing, and we're going to actually, it's going to change how we think about how we farm, and it's going to change land managers and the way that they think about the importance of how other people are farming and ranching in their watersheds. One of the things I like about it is it actually can go to any depth. And all of the old soil monitoring that was being done, we were doing six and eight inch soil monitoring. A lot of the information on carbon sequestration, 
in no-till was one foot deep. When they went to two feet deep, oh my gosh, did that cause a lot of trouble? Flipped everything upside down. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on at two feet. Most of the new research into soil carbon shows that at least half the carbon is actually happening in the subsoil below any monitoring that we're doing. And one thing that I really am proud of practical farmers for doing in their soil carbon research recently is going to three feet. And I've done quite a bit of three foot soil monitoring and it is, <laughs> my hats are off you and, uh, and your backs. If you need, you probably should beef up your health insurance. <laughs> Trying to pull like a soil sampler out of three feet of clay is a real test of the human spirit. <laughs> so tools like the soil information system coupled with the modeling, uh, watershed modeling, valuation, scenario planning tools, we can start to, we're on the edge of a new chapter, I think, of understanding the impacts of our management on soil properties and of being able to think in whole watersheds and to plan different scenarios. And if we want in the future to have performance-based payment for environmental services, arrangements in watersheds to achieve security for urban constituents, basically, um, we're going to need tools like this that can actually quantify what we're doing. Maybe it's better not to be stuck in best management practices mode for the rest of our life. I can implement best management practices on my farm or ranch, but there'll be very different outcomes often than what's happening on a nearby farmer ranch who implemented the same practice. This stuff is real. Cities really need water. And just because I'm doing rotational grazing doesn't mean that the same thing's happening as my neighbor. I'd actually like it to be performance-based. Maybe the easiest way to think about that is in terms of soil carbon. Soil carbon isn't necessarily easy to increase, and I don't think that the book has been written yet, but it would be neat if I was being paid for soil carbon or if soil carbon were a metric in gauging the value of what I was, in gauging the, the worth and the value that I was creating for a downstream city, it'd be neat if I could actually be paid on the actual quantity rather than some mon modeled quantity. I'm going to skip the new soil matrix right now, but I am going to say that I've been working on the software on software-based tools that I hope can be helpful to us in planning. Planning as farmers and ranchers and planning on the watershed scale. It's just taking quite a while. <laughs> so I don't want to overpromise and underdeliver on that. But uh, Practical Farmers of Iowa is certainly one of the first organizations I'll be in touch with as I start doing releases of that in the future. So building momentum toward this. If this kind of stuff makes sense, maybe we're not just growing food, maybe we're growing every environmental service the rest of society needs. We need to improve our chops as land managers. We need to keep innovating, uh, exploring, and sharing information. I think practical farm, I don't have to, I'm preaching to the choir obviously here. Practical Farmers of Iowa to me uh, embodies this sort of spirit. Um, we need to increase our learning rate, but we need to demonstrate what we're doing and quantify it with monitoring. We need to go nuts with monitoring soil. Pull out all the stops. Millions of dollars a year, spending millions of dollars a year is, is bus fare compared to the benefit that we can create for society. We really need to do this. So w one example I'll get to is the Soil Carbon Challenge, but already here in Iowa, Practical Farmers is doing a bunch of great research with soil carbon and infiltration monitoring and all this other research. Um, the monitoring and modeling, it really, it does kind of start with the monitoring, so let's, I'll, I'll just cycle back to that. And I make the point that using the internet to share our message and start communicating about this, again, Practical Farmers of Iowa, I think, is using Farminars, is this what they're called? I think it's a great example, um, because we can't always come together. You know, it costs us 500 or 1,000 bucks to get here and be here, but we can use the internet in our spare time. I think we need to keep doing that. Um, and the soil carbon challenge, as I've mentioned, Peter Donovan is traveling around the U.S. in a converted school bus, establishing carbon, soil carbon baseline plots that are replicable. Uh, he's done a bunch in Mexico, Canada, all around the U.S. He's in Texas right now. And in Texas, people are actually pretty excited about it. The Dixon Water Foundation is backing it because Texas had the worst drought in their history. And so carbon 
water follows carbon. It's actually a loop. It's hard for me to know which comes first and so forth. But one way or the other, water and carbon are intimately tied together. So in Texas, interest is high in the soil carbon challenge. I would encourage people here to join the soil carbon challenge and get someone around here trained or have Peter come around and uh, get in this and get into the community of people who we're all going to be pushing each other on. Let's manage better, increase soil carbon faster. You can go to Soil Carbon Coalition dot org and see instances of where people are increasing soil organic matter. And I guess I'll leave it there. Thanks for your listening and your time. <laughs> Take any questions if people. Well, yes, sir. To be honest, if I have the choice between draining and not draining my land, I get paid for on production. If I have undrained land, you know, I'm not going to be growing much crop or anything. I'm going to drain it. But if we were thinking in whole watersheds, if we were thinking holistically in a nutshell, but actually had tools to do it in a quanti quantified way, then we can think about these things realistically as societies, as watersheds, as towns, as cities, as farmers. But right now, it's incented the wrong way. So we should not probably be critiquing the farmers for doing the basic thing to survive in our economics as their structure. It, this does, I mean, if this stuff is going to be happening, we're going to be thinking holistically and restructuring economic, economics. Well, it's a big deal. Presentations like this need to be made down in the legislature, too, so that we can get some new legislation in that would prevent some of that money. Well, I just want to suggest that there will be an opportunity to have some input on the statewide nutrient reduction strategy that the DNR and the Department of Land Services is working on. I think it's really important for farmers and everyone in this room to get your voice in that process because what they're talking about is exactly what we've discussed today, which is cities offsetting the costs of practice, field level practice changes that farmers would make to reduce the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that's going into all of our water. That's great to hear. So information on that. It's not published yet, but they're they're working on their plan. It's supposed to be out early this week, or early this year. Don't know when. DNR's done. They've been handling this urban side. The Department of Land Services is making some proposals for you know, suggested land management strategies that farmers will be able to choose from and implement. And they're going to figure out a way to compensate for those. So it's real important for farmers to say, we're willing to implement these strategies, we need to be compensated for them. Um, and also, the city needs to be really involved in this. Thank you.
Well, it's great to hear about people that serve. We have bad things should be, you know, penalized. penalized. Well, they are. I mean, some people. No, they aren't. Are. They never are. <laughs> we had a hand up over here. I disagree with the penalties because they, my neighbor drained some wetlands and he lost he lost all the federal wet yeah. money he was getting. Yeah. It, it took somebody to stand up to him. He lost all all the land that's in his name. He lost his federal money. Mm. The farmers are listening to what you're saying now. And what they're doing is stealing a march on it. Because I work with, I have friends with several guys that are tithers, and they said farmers time after time will tell them they want the tithing there now because they think the regulations are going to change and they want a grandfather to So you have, you have to feed them to the tithe. Met on a Carolinian heading south from D.C. Says he's got himself had picked out of seeds. She smiled and said, Richmond. When I asked where she was bound, began to wish my life away to be born.